Okay, hello everyone, my name is James Kotayer. I'll do the introductions later. I'll start first by telling you a story that happened in my past about a decade ago. Yes, I am that old. And it's uh, something that happened about, yeah, about 10 years ago. And this, at the time I was working with this betting company called Betfair back in London. And this is their current website now, okay? It's not, it's not 10 years ago. 10 years ago, the website looked very different. And this product owner came over to me one fine day and told me that we are, uh, they are a British company mainly, right? They have mainly British customers and uh, they want to change. If you can see here on the left, they have a menu with all the sports, right? It's a little bit small, um, but they have a menu with all the sports and they wanted to change the bit that says soccer, this bit over here. I'll just enlarge it so you can see it better. This, this over here, the, the, the sport that says soccer, they wanted to change it so it says football because they're British company and they deal with a lot of British customers and soccer is not very British, right? It's something Americans would say. So they came to me and said, okay, how much, how long would it take you to do this change? I'm like, look, it's, it's an easy change, right? I need, and just need to go through all our repositories and go do a search and replace. And I told them, I don't know, it would take more or less 15 minutes and then we deploy everything. Not a big deal. I said, great, let's start on it. Let's do it. And just as he was leaving, he, he came back and said, oh, by the way, we wanted to say football for the British people, okay, for the English people that are living in the UK. However, if they're Irish or American, it should still say soccer. And this kind of changed everything. Instead of taking me 15 minutes to do, a team of four developers took about three weeks of work to do the simple change. Yeah? And the reason was that whoever, was, whoever developed the website before I had even joined with this company, had made the mistake of thinking that a language and a locale are the same thing. We understand what a language is, however, a locale is something different. Even though both someone in the US and someone in the UK would speak the same language, they, they have different words for different th things, right? If, if the US, ooh, it's hard to speak with the mask. <laughs> if someone in the US says, uh, yeah. say again, sorry? Is it all right if I remove it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think three meters. Oof, I find I'm running out of breath with the mask. <laughs> okay, so someone in the US would say Eklund and someone in the, in the UK would not really understand what the hell he's saying, right? Eklund is aubergine in the, in the UK, right? And the, the problem was that actually who developed this website thought just about languages. He had a list of languages and said English, Portuguese, Spanish, and that's it. Our first initial way of solving it, we thought, okay, we'll just make the UK English appear as if it was another language. We'll just add another drop down on the menu. On our application, we'll replicate every single resource that we have, every single item that we have on the website. We'll just copy it and we'll just change where it says soccer, we'll just say change it to football. The problem with this is that you have a copy of the two things. Now you have two things that you need to maintain. If you add a new sport, if you add a new description, you have to add it in two places, even though it's exactly the same thing, right? And for, for a website like Betfair, we have hundreds and thousands of these resources. These are not just the stuff on the menu, right? This is everything that appears on the website, huge amounts of text. So it's not really feasible, it doesn't scale. You cannot just replicate the entire language. And it's especially bad if you have other languages, if you support the English Canadian, English Australian, and on all of the other languages, you end up with copies and copies of the same thing and now you have to maintain five different copies of the English language, okay, with small variations on each one of them. What we wanted was a system that just lets you override the bits that are different. So for example, if you have soccer that's different, in the British English you just put football and that's it. If a resource is not found on the British English, English it just uses the default one, it uses the American one, right? Horse racing in the US and in the UK is the same thing. You don't need to write it twice. And in this system, you just have the things that are different in different resource files. Okay, so you would have a lot, a lot more concise and every time you need to change one, you most likely don't have to change all the others, right? So it's a, it's, it requires less maintenance. This, by the way, is the standard way of dealing with locales. If you use any, any application framework, any language, it, the stuff comes with it, okay? You don't need to reinvent the wheel. However, the developers that were working there at the time, either maybe because there weren't any libraries at the time that they developed the website, 
or they thought they were smarter, they created their own system and they created something a bit of a monster. So it, the majority of the, of the time to do this change was spent taking off the system that they had developed and using the standard system, okay, this system of hierarchy. And I can literally spend hours talking about stories like this from my past, from my career, where things got really complicated because of some internationalization problem, right? They got the wrong translation or, or something like that. I'll, I'll just mention one more quick story, one that actually had huge financial uh, losses because of this, right? I was working with an investment bank, also in London, and this depart the department where I was working was selling contracts of complex financial instru instruments to, to private investors and to also to other banks. And it was selling them mainly in the UK, okay? It was uh, selling these options or, or these derivatives to UK customers. And when you sell a contract, of course, you have the contact details of that person. So in the UK, you have the address, you have the name, house number, street, postcode, and uh, city. What happened was they were so successful, these products, they thought we'll start selling them in Asia as well. So we got the contract translated in whatever language they needed, and we started um, they started booking these, co these contracts. And when we started sending them the contract document, they were, they, were, they were buying these contracts. And after a couple of months, one of the lawyers told us that these contracts are invalid. The reason was that the place, the template place where we were putting the contracts was following the same British format, right? So the name, uh, house number, ad address, and so on. Whereas, for example, in Japan, you start with the postcode, you get the city, you get the road, house number, finally you put the name, actually you put the surname and the name in the end. So, and because of this, the contract was not valid. So all of, the, all of these uh, instruments that people bought, now imagine you buy an instrument that has, in two months has made you lose money and you suddenly discover that it's not valid. What are you going to do? <laughs> You're going to just throw it away and, tell, and ask for the money to be refunded, right? So this is why like a uh, mistake like this could cost uh, a lot of money, right? This is just one example. As I said, my name is James Cotire. That is my website. Check it out. It's cotirejames.com. James Cotire was taken already. Yeah. <laughs> Say again. Subscribe to my channel. Like <laughs> that is at the end. <laughs> uh, I have over 15 years experience in software development. I currently work with a company called Blip. One thing I forgot to took out, uh, take out is I have some pens, badges and stickers that the company gave me. Uh, for whoever he is here in the office, please uh, take them out at the end. I can help yourself. Uh, Blip is a company that has the local office. Uh, it is owned by the company called Flutter, okay, our parent company. The office here is called Blip. And you probably heard of Flutter. If you haven't heard of Flutter, you probably heard of one of these brands. Okay, probably familiar with Poker Stars, Petty Power, Betfair. It's the biggest betting and betting and gambling company in the world. Okay, depending on which metric you use, of course. Uh, if you're American, you probably he heard of FanDuel. I am originally from Malta. Okay, but I moved to Porto uh, about six years ago. I was living in London before that. This is Malta, I said, yeah. in case, I know you guys have an office, over, you had an office over there and you have some people living there or, as well. But anyway, I, I'm originally from Malta, but I haven't been in Malta for over 15 years. I am also an author of uh, several publications. One of them is a computer science book. And in my spare time, I am a Udemy instructor. This picture is a bit old. I have a few more courses now. But yeah, they're a, bit, they're a bit more intermediate level, okay, so for people that know a little bit of development already. But yeah, if you're interested, check them out. In my spare time, I like surfing. Do we have any surfers in the room? <laughs> we have a surfer, good. Okay. Um, scuba diving, any scuba divers? We have a free diver. Is Jose is attending in the P free dives. Hi, Jose. In Malta. <laughs> cool. Nice. <laughs> He's crazy. Nice to meet you. <laughs> and I also uh, love motorbikes, okay? This is my motorbike. It's, I have a... Oh, knee, Say again, sorry? Oh, it's, your knee. it's okay. <laughs> He's joking because he knows I broke my knee in a motorbike accident, accident about a year ago or something. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. I didn't do it. Eh? Someone else crashed into me. But anyway, motorbike is fine now. It's fixed. 
Okay, but enough about me. Let's talk a little bit about you. And I want to ask you guys if you have ever done any programming whatsoever. And because we have people remote, working remote, let me just pull this survey up. So if you go to mentor.com and use the code that's appearing on the screen, you can type which programming language you have used in the past. If you have done any programming, if you haven't done any programming at all, just leave it empty, right? And it should start popping up the things that you type. Guys, if you, also if you have any questions while I'm speaking, please interrupt me, it's not a problem, okay? Okay, so we have some HTML, some basic HTML as well, JavaScript, super basic. We have some CSS as well. For those of you, who, we have some Pascal and Delphi. Say again? It's really old, right? Yeah, and well. It's C++ now, right? It's what? C++, did it change names? C++? Yeah. No, it's another language, right? Yeah, I don't know. I've, I've never done Delphi, but... Uh, it's a valid programming language. I think it's a lot more valid than JavaScript, in my view, or CSS or HTML. Never, ever. Okay, let's let's move on. But we have a little bit. We have a couple of people that have done a few lines of code in the past, right? So they they know at least what programming is. But uh, it feels like a lot of you are beginners as well, right? So. I was asked to do a quick slide about the different technologies that we have in programming and why we have so many technologies. And these are the programming languages that uh, are the most popular ones. If I had to include all the programming languages that are in the world that are that exist in the world, a slide wouldn't be enough, right? There's literally thousands of them. But these are probably the the most popular. I might have forgotten <laughs> a couple, okay? But these are the ones uh, I'm sure that they're very used. On the right, we have Ruby and Python, extremely popular programming languages. They're very easy to use. And if you're thinking of learning a programming language, I would start from one of these because they're very simple to learn. Okay, they're, they're very good with beginners and they're very popular. So with startup companies, they're not toys. Okay, they're not toy programming languages. They're fully fledged. You can build really complicated software. Just to give you an idea, Airbnb uses Ruby, right? So they're not like something you would just use for, I don't know, to, to, to build a small startup. Okay, on the lower part of the screen, this part over here, we have the C++, Go and Rust. These are languages that you, these are the opposite. These are the hardcore nerdy languages, right? These are built for performance and for, like if you, for example, were writing a controller that controls the autopilot of an aircraft, you would use probably C++, right? This is, this is the hardcore uh, programming. Or, for example, if you're writing an algorithmic trading algorithm, you would use one of these languages. Here in the middle, we have Java, Kotlin, and Scala. These are the enterprise programming languages. Typically, big businesses that have been around for a few years have adopted these languages. This is, these are also the languages that I mostly use on a day-to-day -day basis in the company that I work with. And the reason why they're so popular, the ones in the middle, are because they were very popular about 20 years ago when they came out, or 15 years ago when they came out, Java mainly, right? And the companies that were startups at the time are now giants <laughs> 15 years later, right? So they're, they're, they're the ones that uh, employ most of the people. Then we have C Sharp and F Sharp. These are the Microsoft programming languages, these ones over here, okay? They run on Microsoft products and it's... It's again, they're, again, they're very popular as well. And then these ones over here are the ones that were mentioned. Some of them, some of these were mentioned on the poll that we did, right? These are the JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. These are the front end languages, the ones that you use to build like the interfaces for, uh, for, for web pages and so on. JavaScript is a programming language as well. You can use it in other parts, not just for the front end. To talk, I want to talk also a little bit about the architecture that we have in my company at, at uh, Petty Power Betfair, okay, or, or, uh, or Blip. I'll briefly talk a little bit about it just so you have an idea of what the technologies that we use underneath and how the systems interact together. And I'm going to talk about it from the client point of view, like from someone that's sitting in front of his computer or watching um, his mobile phone, okay? They see our website but there's a lot of technology behind that website. 
and the first, and, and there's, it's mainly divided, all of that technology, all of that tech is divided into categories, into blocks. The first part is what, kind of what the user sees. It's the applications that present the data to the user. You can call this the presentation layer. In our company, we call it channels. I think that's unique. We call it channels because it deals with different channels, right? With desktop, with mobile, with TV, and so on. But basically, these are applications that decide how a website should look, right? which graphics it should use, which language it should choose, where things are on the web on the web page. And typically, the application that you have running on the phone or on your browser, and this layer that communicates with it, is called front end. Sometimes you see it on, um, on I don't know if you watch them, <laughs> but sometimes you see it on developers uh, uh, ad to recruit uh, adver uh, to recruit developers for AdWords, you see front-end developer required in JavaScript. This is what they mean by front-end. Some, someone that builds software in this, in this layer, okay? Behind this presentation layer, there's the complex logic that deals with business. Okay, this is, if, if I can use an analogy of this, right, the presentation layer would be, if you buy a car, for example, the presentation layer would be what you see with your eyes, right? The color of the car, the seats, the, the, the interior design and things like that. The business logic is the stuff that he is hidden underneath the hood. The engine, the transmission, the exhaust, the, 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 the hydraulics and things like that. So the business logic it is what makes the business work. And then you present it to the user with the presentation uh, application. B the business logic in a company like Flutter and ours would include, for example, knowing what odds to set on a particular outcome. So there's a game, Porto versus Roma, okay, versus Rome, and uh, you, you want to, to know which odds you should set on each one of them. The calculations to figure out which odds to use happens in the business logic. This is the most complicated part of the application usually, right? It also deals with communication with external parties. For example, we want to know what the score of a game is so we can set the scores accordingly or display them on the site, the, the, this layer deals with that communication, okay, with external third parties. And this, as you expect, is called the backend part of your architecture. Again, you, you might see adverts for it, backend developer required for this language or whatever. Right, sometimes you also, this is, by the way, the area that I mostly work in, okay, in backend development, although I can do a little bit of both. The other advert that you see sometimes on these, uh, on these job postings is you see a full stack developer. This is someone that has skills in both layers. It's a little bit of jack of all trades. He's not specialized in one or the other. I have presented the architecture in a very simple way, okay, with just two layers. Unfortunately, in a company big like, like ours, the situation is a lot more complicated. We adopt an, an architecture that is called microservices. Think about it, the, the best way to explain it is to think about small, very, uh, very specific applications running on different servers and they all have a very specific task, like for example, returning the balance of a user, setting the odd on an outcome, uh, communicating with an external provider, very specific task. And they all communicate with each other, these small microservices, to build the entire application. The advantage of this kind of architecture is that when, of one, when one of your services goes down, you don't have the whole website crashed, right? You just have that specific function that doesn't work very well. For example, you might have withdrawals or with deposits into your, into your account that doesn't work, right? You just have one specific function that fails as opposed to everything. These micro, this microservice architecture is very widely adopted in the industry. For example, Netflix uses this, a lot of the big companies use this kind of architecture. This is not the only architecture that we use, okay, in, in our company, this is the main one, but we use different, of course, architecture and technologies depending on what problem we're trying to solve. And this, these are the technologies that we use in each end, right, in the front end and the back end. We typically use the front end JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. Back end, we use Scala, Java, a little bit of Kotlin, and also some C Sharp. Internationalization, right, is the process to make your application work in a global world, in different continents and different cultures and so on. It's not just about translation, okay, internationalization. It's, it's a lot wider than that. For example, we as a betting company, you can imagine it's a heavily regulated uh, uh, industry 
and the regulations that exist, for example, in Portugal would be very different than the ones in Italy or in the UK. So the backend, for example, needs to know these differences in regulations. For example, in Italy, we have to report every single bet that we take with the regulator. So the backend is responsible to deal with that communication. However, you guys are mostly a translation company and translations, or to be more specific, it's called localization, okay, because you're translating different locales, happens mostly in the front end part. It's the front end that determines what language it should display to the user and converts the view into that language, okay, into that locale. And we're gonna dig deeper on how localization work, okay? We're just going to focus on that part of internationalization, not the whole picture, just on localization, because this is probably more relevant to your company, okay? So let's say we have a mobile phone that is accessing a particular web page. What happens behind the scenes is that mobile phone will make a request, a call to that web server that is hosting your application. And it says, I want the view of the website in American English. Okay, it, it, the mobile, when you install your browser or when you install your application, you specify which language you want. And this is the language that, the, that, that, is, that sends to the web server saying, I want to use this language. And that web server generates a view of what you, the web page should look like and sends it back to the mobile phone. I have this stupid uh, example here saying, hello, this is a cookie. The reason I have cookie over there is because cookie is not the same in English and in American English, right? So in American English, we say hello and we say cookie. It's supposed to say this is a cookie over there, but I couldn't fit it, okay? So we have like on the web server in your application, you would have these resource files that contain all the resources that is, are available on your website. And because you specify American, the web server will open the file of English American and it will render the page with those resources. If you specify English GB, English British, okay, you will have another file that overrides just the, 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 the things that are different. In this case, biscuit, okay, this is a biscuit. So you'd have the extra file that contains that. However, you will not override the text that says hello, okay, because it's the same. In, in, in American and British English, you still say hello. You can have a Portuguese one, and now you have to override everything, because if you don't override, for example, hola, it will say hello on the website, right? So if you just override cookie with bolacha, I'm probably saying that wrong, okay? <laughs> it will just say, uh, hello, this is a bolacha, okay? Well, yeah, something like that. <laughs> and you can also put another level of over, overriding to say Portuguese, Brazilian. Now, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but in Portuguese, Brazilian, they don't. They say biscotto and not bolacha. This is what Google told me. But yeah, never more. Oh, but in Rio, it is going to in São Paulo in bolacha. Okay, cool. I don't know. It was quite a difficult task to find a word that is different in the U.S. in American, in Portuguese, and in Portuguese Brazilian. Okay, so <laughs> and, <laughs> lie to me next time. <laughs> anyway, but bolacha, uh, according to the website I found, is is biscotto in Portuguese Brazilian. Okay. And you can override it in that way as well. So it's this hierarchical over, overriding, okay, that we saw also in the beginning. The, the way you build this kind of web page uh, when you develop it is when you are building this view, you specify, you don't specify what you want on the view. You don't specify, hello, this is a cookie. Like the developers wouldn't just write English in there. They would write a key. In this case, it's called main page dot greeting and main page dot description. They would simply enter that key. And then in the files that define these resources, they would have a key and a value. Main page dot greeting equals hello. Main page dot description equals this is a cookie. And you'd have the same thing in British English in every single file that you define. You have this mapping of key and values that are then rendered into, into, into this view, into this web page. Unfortunately, because we have such a zoo of programming languages and technologies, we also have like a zoo of different file formats that these key and properties are defined. You might have encountered these before if you work during your translations. We have files like JSON, properties file, pot files, uh, po files, and uh, YAML files. These are an example of the, of the languages that use these type of files. For example, Java uses properties, uh, Ruby uses YAML files, okay, and so on. I'll show you an example of each one of them before we move on to the practical side of things, okay? Okay, so if we 
if I switch on to IntelliJ. So this is called IntelliJ. It is a tool that developers use to write their code. Okay, it's one of the tools. There's many, there's many different tools, of course. And here we have a folder called example source files, and we have a directory which, with each of those tools. Let's start from let's start from the easy one, which is the properties file, which is probably like if you if which is used by Java, right? So this is probably the one that you will see the most, okay? Because a lot of the big companies use Java. I think we see the most is JSON. Yeah. JSON, really? Okay. It's unfortunate because that's also the most complicated one. But <laughs> so anyway, the the properties file is a simple one, right? So you have the key, and then you have equals. And then you have the value. That's it. If you want to to overwrite something, right? You just have this overridden in the British English. Okay, key and the value. As simple as that. Let's move on to any questions around that. No. The YAML file is used mainly in Ruby, so you would have the locale specified. So in the properties file, the locale is specified in the file name. All right. So here you have English, GB. The default one, you don't specify a locale. And the default in 99% of the cases is American English, okay? Moving on to YAML files, uh, you don't need to specify the locales on the file name, okay? But a lot of people do. The important thing is that you specify it in here. The, the format of the YAML file is that every time you have a nested uh, property, you move two spaces. Okay, so then you have another nested property, you move to four spaces. Okay, this is important because this, this file format, if you, if you forget one space, if you do something like this, it doesn't compile, it doesn't work. Um, but basically this is the same thing. The key here is main page greeting, and you say hello. Main page description, this is a cookie. All right, if you want to override, you'd have main page description, this is a biscuit. Let's move on to the JSON files. This is a JSON file. Um, and this will vary, the format of this will vary slightly depending on which technology the client is using, okay? But in general, you have something like this, right? So in the beginning, you have a header or metadata that will give a little bit of information around the JSON file. You have things like the author who created this file when it was last updated and the locale that's using. In this case, it's English, okay? English American probably. And some documentation, yeah? Sure, Rodrigo's asking a question, sorry. <laughs> Good question, right? So the YAML file is a very sensitive, like the one that we saw before, this is very sensitive to formatting, right? If you leave one space back, bad, it will screw up everything, okay? The JSON file is not like that. It's as long as you keep, there's a few rules you cannot break, right? So you cannot omit commas for sure, because it will, it will screw up everything. However, the spaces are not important at all. And in fact, I can leave it like this and it will work fine. And here, this tool that I'm using, IntelliJ, I can press a shortcut key and it will format it for me, right? It just does it automatically. This is just so it's more readable for you. But a program reading JSON will have no problem at all reading this or this. In fact, what happens most of the time is that when, when we get a, like a readable JSON format, we have, we pass it through a small program that removes all the white space, okay? That removes all of these spaces to make it a bit more concise. So instead of taking huge amounts of space, it takes less, okay? Because it's really easy to format it for, so it's more readable for humans. So, so the formatting is, is there just for us to read better, but the computer does not really care about the formatting, okay? This is different than YAML files. YAML files are very sensitive to formatting, okay? So that's the difference between JSON and formatting, and, and uh, YAML. The one thing to keep in mind is uh, how to escape these quotation marks, right? Let's say here you say, uh, Jane said hello there. Okay, this is a problem, right? Because you're using quotation marks inside JSON. And the compiler here, as you can tell, like this tool that I'm using, IntelliJ, it says, this is a, I don't know what the hell you're doing here, right? <laughs> because it's, it's going outside the, the, this protocol. What you need to do is to escape the quotation marks. You put a slash in front of them, okay? And then it's fine. So when this is rendered on the web page, the slash are, are 
taken away, okay? And they're just rendered as if they were quotation marks. Okay, so it's something to keep in mind in JSON, you just need to, to escape it. Usually Google is your friend. If you, if you see something that it's not working properly, just Google it. The other thing to have in mind, what if, what if you want to put a slash in your document, right? Hello there. Right. What you do is you, you do a double one, right? So you're escaping the escape character, okay? So this, and it will only appear as one. Cool, so that's, that's JSON. Um, you have the keys specified in this hierarchical way. So main page greeting description. Let's look at the last file format that we have. And this is something that's used in Python, okay? You have the locale over here specified in the directory, not in the file name. And here the key is specified on a separate line with the, the, the token message ID and you have the message string after it with saying hello. Okay, this is just, I haven't seen this, this, uh, this file format used often, right? It's not a very popular file format, but it's there, I don't know. It's the default one that Python uses. Okay, so now we'll move on to the practical part of the talk, which is where you will get your hands dirty and try to translate a website, okay? <laughs> so if, you, if we go to uh, the URL called allin.eu.west, dash tree dot elastic beanstalk dot com <laughs> I will send that to you okay so this is a, a, a simple website is something I put together in like an hour okay well it's not I didn't really spend a lot of time with, on it and it has a couple of recipes okay the perfect tuna melt and the harissa paste it's a really nice paste by the way if you want to try it out the interesting bit about this website is that it has uh, localization okay we can click on those on that menu and we can choose a number of languages so for example if I go on I don't know Italian it doesn't really translate yet the only thing that's translated is the heading okay it's saying La Cucina Esotica all right everything else stays the same this is because we haven't yet implemented the the, the translation part of things show you what's happening underneath the hood okay what's happening in in the code so then we can maybe translate it together so if i go back to the intellij this is the code that runs that application so you remember how i i kind of mentioned that in, in some companies you have this divide between the front end and the back end and this is like a very small simplified version of this right we have one application that has th these two layers inside we have the back end over here that's written in Java, okay? If you open, this is Java code, okay? You don't need to worry about this. You, you, you probably never read, need to write any Java code, but this is just for your interest. This is more or less what Java code looks like. And this is the back end of the application. It's very simple. The only logic that we have over here is to support localization, is to support the different languages. The interesting bit for you guys is the front end, the stuff that is displayed to the user. If we go under templates and we open the main page.html, this is what the user sees, or this is the code that tells what the user should see. If you go here, for example, on the title, you see that the title is recipes. And if we go back to our web page, you can see over here in the tab, it's a bit small, sorry about that, it says recipes, okay? So if I had to change that, it will change on the website once I deploy it. And this, all of this code uh, displays that on the website. So for example, over here we say we have, let's, let, let me show you something for example. So here is the sandwich.jpg. It's, it's saying display the image and the, 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 the image is the sandwich.jpg. And if we go here, I have also with part of this application, the sandwich.jpg, okay? The, the ones that, that we saw on the website. You notice that there nowhere here you cannot find for example the bit that says the perfect tuna melt okay you cannot find it here what you can find instead instead is these kind of weird tags that are saying over here i want to i want you to display uh, the key tuna melt over here i want you to display the first ingredient of that recipe second ingredient and so on and you find all of this defined everywhere on the page what this is, is it's kind of telling the, the application that it should use 
the translations for this key. If we go down to this message, message resource bundle, we can open the messages.properties, and this is a property file, and you can find all the keys and the values here. So main page tuna melt will say the perfect tuna melt. All right. And if we had to, for example, open the messages of Italian, there's only one key in here saying main page food la cucina esotica. All right. So this is what you see over here. The, the reason why the rest of the page is not translated is because we ha don't have the keys. Let's just do one quick translation over here and then I'll let you guys try to do the rest of the translation. I'll, I'll talk a little bit on how we can do it. Actually, let me, let, let's talk about it now. So I'm hoping you all have a GitHub account. All right, if you, I'll send the, the link as well for this. If you go under, yeah. So this, what you see over here, let me just increase the size. What you see over here is what we had, is a copy of what we have running for this application. So if you notice here, for example, is that these three directories are also found over here. So this Git is a tool that we use as the developers to share code with others or to collaborate together. When you have a team of developers and they want to work on the same code base, we use Git to, uh, to synchronize our work. So everything that you see over here is kind of mirrored on this public uh, repository. Everyone can see this, okay? So if you go to source, I'll send the link to this, and you go to main resources, you get all the message, uh, the, the message, the translation files over here. It's a good idea to open two tabs for the exercise, okay, with the same page. And you just put it in a new window and just split the screen into okay so you have both files on either side you open the message the properties and then if you want to do a translation of a particular language let's let's do the english great britain okay and i can click on this i can over here edit file yeah you can click on edit file and then you can edit it directly without having the tools that you need with the tools that i have running i intellij here so for example, does, let's, let's have a look at the Harissa uh, paste recipe. Never thought I would say that in a, in a talk. <laughs> but uh, uh, there's a key over here that says ingredient number two, half a teaspoon of cilantro seeds. Does anyone know what cilantro is? Yes, yes it's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's what, sorry? I guess, yeah, it's similar, because it's a Spanish word, is it? Yeah, it's coriander, exactly. So the, if you go to a British person and say what cilantro is, they wouldn't know, right? Or at least they would, they would it's not the, the word that they would use. For them, it's coriander, right? So if I go in here and I change this, however, the Americans use cilantro for some weird reason. Uh, James, mm -hmm. how do you get there? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll come around and help you with, with the okay. edits, yeah? So once you, once you edit something, this, let, me just, let me just put this on full screen. Once you edit something, you need to commit it. You need to push it to the repository, right? So at the end of this page here, after you do your changes, you scroll to the bottom, you write a description, say, and say it's updated English, uh, English GB, okay? And then you commit your changes, and that's it. You should, have, you should all have access to this repository. And now we have the, the, the thing over there, okay? And now if I just update this file, this is the British, right? So if I do here, every time you change something in the Git repository, every, the developers should, we call it pull, right? It's a technical term to pull the changes locally from, from, uh, from Git, well, in this case, from GitHub. Okay, and you have the changes over there. And now next time I deploy it, it will say coriander instead of what was it, cilantro, yeah? So now the difficult bit is the bit where you will do the changes, okay? Where you will do the, the translations. If you go to the link that Tiago sent, you can pick a language and, and start doing some translations. However, it's, it might be better to organize a little bit, <laughs> otherwise everyone's gonna do the Portuguese translation, right? 
because um, I know there's about 12 of you doing Portuguese translations. How, how do you want to do it? We can split into Zoom, uh, into Zoom rooms, like different breakout rooms, okay. and one of you guys can share the screen in each room and you, you help each other out. I see that the, the English, British was updated, the Maltese, the Greek two minutes ago, Spanish as well, and, and the Portuguese 24 seconds ago. <laughs> okay, so if we go back to IntelliJ, okay, the tool that we use, and I just need to do git pull. Okay, I'll pull all the changes that you guys have committed. Okay, it's, it's downloading the changes. And if I go on the source main messages, it's still downloading. There you go. Okay, let's open the Greek. Let's see how it looks. It's characters I don't even understand. She could have written a lot of swear words over there, right? She probably did. But anyway, so... <laughs> okay, so now we can just try to deploy this. So let me just uh, try to deploy this. So the, the application is currently running on AWS. I don't know if you've heard of AWS. It's this Amazon kind of hosting service, okay? So I need to build it. Building involves getting all the code, compiling it, and putting it in this, into this like one package so it can be uploaded. All right, and this is what it's doing right now. It's, uh, it's uh, building all the f source files, putting them in one file. The file is called this, uh, this jar, okay, this fat jar. And once it's finished, it takes a few seconds, hopefully it'll be done soon. Once it's finished, I just need to upload it. And to upload it, I just need to do deploy on this file, on this, in this window. And then the changes will all be visible to all of you guys. So the build has been successful. Just need to hit deploy. Um, it will contain all the resources that you guys have entered. All right, that you guys have did. did. And uh, it will take a few seconds as well. OK, so this has... Uh, Completed. Let's check out the website. Hopefully it will work here. Okay. And if we refresh this This is the Italian version and if we go, let's let's start with the Maltese It's saying grams now as you can see. Yeah Milliliters. Good job over there. Let's check out the Greek And yep, lots of characters. I don't understand <laughs> Looks good Greek team rules. <laughs> All right, which other language? We have Portuguese. Oh. No, so the Portuguese, remember the hierarchical stuff? So I, I chose Brazilian, right? So Portuguese Brazil. So if the translation is not located under Portuguese Brazil, it's going to pick, it's going to pick up the Portuguese one, right? So which, that's why it's quite clever like that. You don't need to specify it twice. So, yeah, I, <laughs> I like this translation. Autum perfetto. Okay. So this is the Portuguese. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. The last bit is not there. Why? Yeah, the last bit is the other part of the thing. It isn't there either. What's not here? The last bit about the chefs, for example. Did you commit? It was a bit of poetry. Did you commit or? I, I always commit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, Let's have a look. I think it, 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 it might be. It, it, there might be a, a problem with. The yeah, okay. So it's yeah. also possible that you kind of overwrote each other, right? Um, So we can check the history of this, right? So we can figure out what he 
what Tiago really updated. Let's see if he's lying or not. How can we see the difference? This one. Yeah, th this is the thing that you wrote, but someone overwrote it afterwards. That's a problem, right? So we can merge these things together afterwards. The, the thing is, you're, you're not supposed to edit directly on the Git, on the website, right? You're supposed to use a tool and then upload afterwards. But it's uh, yeah, it's it's hard. We don't have the tools here. To work. Okay, which other languages did we have? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we have used Portuguese. We used. Uh, I think that's all. Spanish, yes, sorry, I forgot about the Spanish. There you go. And we have the Spanish. It's good work, Spanish team. Well done. Sorry, we're five years old. Well, the Portuguese are laughing at the Spanish. Too much porn. Too much porn. Exactly. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, but the the, the, the scope of the, the presentation was not to do not to do translations, right? But to learn how kind of it works more or less underneath the hood. Okay, that's all I have for you guys today. Please follow me on Twitter. <laughs> I'm trying to increase my my, my 100 followers. Um, those are my links. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah.